All right, welcome to Leadership Choices. Uh, we're going to do your final review. Um, so feel free to uh, you know have this out um, and follow along, uh, and we'll just kind of go right through these. I'll just go ahead and tell you um, on this one, it's it's a little different. Uh, I mean, it's still the same basic style, but you'll probably notice that there's a few more of the the short answer um, or long answer, however you look at it. Uh, kind of in your own words questions. Uh, this is one of your senior level courses uh, in terms of what I've been teaching you and then you know the uh, whatever research you've been doing on your own uh, for this course and so basically what I'm after in a senior level course is I may not have gone over tons of material but I went over some very important material that requires perhaps a lot of critical thinking on your own part to maximize its its use for you right so maybe another way of saying that is it's it's kind of a a complex and rich kind of topic that we've kind of brought up that is going to require some of your own insight and really kind of digging into it to understand how you're going to apply these big principles so it's it's not a class where i give you 10 steps to to you know, do a uh, a business plan, or we show you how to do a cash flow statement. It's more let me give you some big uh, theoretical concepts to think about, and then um, and then so now in the final, I'm more interested in can you recite back to me the basics of these uh, principles, right? Uh, that we've kind of laid into this course. So that's why it's a lot of the, the in your own words kind of questions, right? So there's a long way of just explaining. That's why I've set up your final this way. So it's not as many questions. It's only 15. But um, but a lot of them are going to be ones that you have to kind of put into your own words. All right? Number one, explain in your own words the significance for motivation studies of the Harlow and DC experiments. Um, so if if you remember, I'll give you just a little kind of clue on that one. Um, that Harlow and DC were kind of scientists that had done their experiments, you know, back in I want to say the 40s into the 60s through that time period. Um, Harlow had monkeys solve a puzzle um, without any external motivation or internal motivation, um, and they still did it. And so it kind of led to the conclusion that these monkeys have some kind of uh, uh, intrinsic desire just to do the task, right? You know, so it wasn't an external motivation like reward. It wasn't some kind of internal thing that would have been obvious like hunger or thirst, that there was actually something else, just the, the satisfaction of solving the puzzle that the monkeys were actually using. Um, and then the DC study um, found that... Uh, if when humans were given a reward, their motivation actually decreased long term, uh, almost like a drug. You have to keep upping the reward to keep their motivation high. Um, whereas if you never gave them an external reward, their motivation sa stayed fairly high and fairly consistent, right? And so, um, and so those are the two experiments. So basically, for this question, I'm wanting you to take that information, the study about how the monkeys had something internal that motivated them just for the satisfaction of accomplishing a purpose, a task, uh, combined with DC's finding that humans, if you give them external motivation, it actually has the opposite effect to what you would think long term. Uh, that really in order to get humans to be effective long term, you have to tap in to their internal uh, intrinsic desire, almost like the monkeys, right? How the monkeys had that intrinsic desire. So to do humans, so I want you to kind of formulate that into your own words and kind of give me a, a coherent thought about the significance of those two studies. Number two, explain, uh, it should be explained in your own words, why research shows that more people experience optimal moments while at work um, than at leisure, right? Um, so the basic idea there is it's, it, it's going to be that... Um, that what causes people to experience optimal moments is the satisfaction that comes with achieving purpose, with you know 
uh, fulfilling some kind of internal drive, purpose, you know, th that type of intrinsic motivation that we're talking about. Um, and so even though people really enjoy leisure, uh, when they start talking about things that they're really proud of and things that have really made a difference in their life, the majority of people will have more of those moments that they experienced at work connected with some type of accomplishment of a task. Um, and it just goes to show that people are very much motivated not just by what feels good but by fulfillment of purpose. Right? Number three, explain the significance of the Tom Sawyer example. Basically, if you remember, this is when Tom Sawyer was uh, hated whitewashing and so in order to get his buddies to do it he pretended like he loved it and it was the greatest thing in the world and then they wanted to do it uh, and so they did it and they loved it right and they, they even paid to do it um, so it's it's the idea that uh, that motivation often influences people's effort and work and that uh, because Tom Sawyer framed it in such a way that they wanted to do it they saw it as joy instead of as uh, work. Number four, explain in your own words two advantages of using intrinsic motivation. Um, so these next two are ones that you're going to have to go back in and look at the videos for, right? So I did a lot on the intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic. So it, and these are not the same question. If you look at four and five, four is saying what are the advantages of intrinsic motivation. Five is what are the disadvantages of extrinsic motivation. So you need to have kind of different lines of thought there. Um, so what works well with intrinsic motivation? What's an advantage? And then I gave you some disadvantages. Um, so don't just give me the opposite of four, right? So don't write, you know, intrinsic motivation motivates people good, and in five, extrinsic motivation doesn't motivate people good, right? So don't do that. Um, make your answers to five just on you know, a different line of thought than your answers from four, right? Don't just do the exact opposite of what you wrote in four. Number six, what is the best way to reward performance without hindering intrinsic motivation? Uh, so I want something along the lines of... Um, of things like uh, public recognition, uh, you know, those types of, of rewards um, that are not like the financial kind of stuff, right? So um, non-tangible rewards, things like praise in public, you know, that kind of stuff, um, because those tend to be less erosive to overall motivation levels, you know, as opposed to giving them a cash reward or something like that. Number seven, explain why using reward or punishment as motivation might cause you to miss underlying problems in your organization. Um, so something to the effect that uh, if whenever there's a, a, a problem, if you just use reward to, uh, to push people through it or punishment in the face of it, you may not be dealing with what caused them to have the problem in the first place, right? So just simply trying to motivate people past problems may just mask over the problem, right? And so instead of using rewards or punishments to get people to move past problems, sometimes it's better to not use those at all and to just look at what is the actual problem. Can we fix the problem and not have to motivate them with some kind of reward, all right? Um, Number eight, explain in your own words the categories of type I and type X. So I want you to go back in, look at that video, and uh, just give me a, a, you know some kind of statement explaining what's type I, what's type X, uh, and what are the differences between the two of them. In what situations um, might extrinsic rewards be advantageous? So that's things that are very repetitive, right, where there's not going to be much of an intrinsic motivation, right? So if you're just counting beans in a factory, they're, they're, your management is not going to probably be able to come up with some kind of intrinsic motivation that's just all of a sudden going to make you love doing something that's just repetitive and boring. So on those types of jobs, you may need to have some kind of reward or incentive program. But for other things where, you know, if somebody's being creative or something like that, you know, the the 
joy of producing what they're going to produce can be a motivating factor that needs to be maximized as opposed to trying to throw money at something that you could have developed an intrinsic motivation for. So the answer to this question are things where there's not a clear intrinsic motivation that are things that are very repetitive or boring. Number 10, list and define the four categories of organizational culture. All right, I'll give you the four just so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, but then as far as um, going back in and getting the definition, I'm going to leave that up to you. So it's adaptability culture, achievement culture, involvement culture, and consistency culture. Okay, let's go back in and look at those four. Number 11, explain in your own words what it means to be a cultural architect. So I'm going to leave that one up to you. We did an entire video on that. Uh, number 12, explain how physical space might influence organizational culture. Um, you know, something to the effect that the, the colors you choose, the, the layout of the office, those types of things have an effect. So, so kind of think about that, you know, um, there's a lot of, you know, are, is management separate from the workers? Uh, are the customers separate from the workers? Is the atmosphere light and playful? Is it dark and serious? Is it, um, you know, so physical space can contribute to organizational culture. Right? Thirteen, to exercise leadership, you must inherently believe that you are a leader. Right? Fourteen, explain in your own words the spiritual principles required for a leader to walk in the position that God has prepared for them. Um, I'll give you the two that I'm thinking of off the top of my head. So you'll have to watch the video for this, The Spirit of Leadership. But I'm, I'm kind of thinking about that section where I'm talking about faith and humility, right? And so go back in and kind of formulate that into your own words. Uh, but that's the section that I'm talking about, okay? Fifteen, explain in your own words what it means that God has placed leadership capacity within you. Uh, so this one is also one you have to go back in and watch that video on. But what I'm, I'm thinking about is the section where I'm talking about how um, God has placed uh, the ability to be a leader in you, right? And so that's something God's put in there. So what does that mean for you to know that, that it's in there? Um, that God's put it in you already. Uh, that's what I'm uh, after in that question. Okay, so you know, it's it's a shorter final, but in some ways it might actually be a longer final for you because this is your senior level class. So in terms of just total number of questions, it's shorter. In terms of the work that you may have to do to prepare for this one, might be a little longer. But this is one of your senior classes. Okay, so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me and I'll try and help. Okay.